Um, uh, I'm very happy to be speaking alongside my former colleague and friend, uh, Michael Waldstein, under whose direction I began to teach, and thanks to whom I met my wife. So it's, uh, it's quite a debt. Uh, I wish that our mutual friend, uh, David Schindler, were still with us. So my title is The Sacramental Arc <laughs> of... Senior. Uh, senior. <laughs> The uh, Sacramental Arc of, of Wojtyla's Philosophy of Action. Um, this is my attempt to present a transdisciplinary and radically contextual theology in support of a cultural revolution. That is, in support of a culture that would honor God and hold fast to the inviolability and holiness of his commandments. To prepare for the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII established an ante-preparatory commission which was tasked with writing to all of the bishops of the church, as well as superiors of religious congregations, to ask for suggestions and input for the council's agenda. Of course, not all of the world's bishops responded, but of those that did, most responded with various suggestions that pertain to the organization and internal life of the church. For example, they wrote about the need to reform seminary education, about the need to improve the relationship between clerics and laity, about updating aspects of canon law, etc. The young auxiliary bishop of Krakow responded differently. He had been consecrated bishop just over a year earlier at the young age of 38. Rather than the church examining its own structures and internal practices, Wojtyla suggested a different path. His submission to the preparatory commission began with a reflection on the nature of the human person. A unique being, I quote, a unique being who lives in a material world, but who has intense spiritual longings, a mystery to himself and to others, a creature whose dignity emerges from an interior life imprinted with the image and likeness of God. The crucial issue of our times and the key question for the upcoming council is the human person. The Christian faithful and also unbelievers want to hear what the church has to say about the human person and the human condition today, particularly in light of other proposals, scientific, positivist, dialectical, proposals that imagine themselves humanistic and present themselves as road to liberation. What is Christian personalism and how is it different from other accounts of the human person on offer in modernity? It is not surprising that in the years following the council, John Paul II would emphasize one particular passage from Gaudium et Spes as the heart of the council's message. It's a passage cited in almost every major document that he wrote. Jesus Christ, in revealing the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his high calling. These words, he says, are especially dear to me. They serve as one of the constant reference points of my teaching together with the related text of Gaudium et Spes 24 on the logic of a sincere gift of self. This teaching of Gaudium et Spes, he writes, can be said to sum up the whole of Christian anthropology. The challenge of responding to the fundamental question of our time, what does it mean to be a human being? What is our origin and destiny? Is also the responsibility and vocation of philosophy. While he was working on the commission responsible for drafting and revising Gaudium et Spes, Wojtyla devoted his rare moments of free time to writing the book Person and Act. The aim of the book, he says in a letter to Henri de Lubac, is a kind of recapitulation of the inviolable mystery of the person. The guiding premise for Wojtyla's reflection is the axiom operare sequitur esse, action follows or is grounded in being. Human action, especially moral action, represents a privileged point of access for understanding the essence and the unique dignity of the human person. The fruit of this major work in philosophical anthropology is simultaneously a new sense of the depth and drama of action, a vertical transcendence whereby a person's free acts in relation to the truth determine oneself as good or evil and a deeper appreciation of the inviolable dignity and responsibility of the person as a unique subject endowed with freedom. So the task assigned to me is to consider how some of the themes and ideas of person and act are taken up and developed 
in John Paul II's subsequent writings. This is a vast topic that should include, among other things, John Paul II's contribution to the social doctrine of the church, his development of the church's teaching on the nature and sacramentality of marriage, his account of the relationship between freedom and truth, and the foundation of the church's moral teaching, and the importance of Christian philosophy and the bond of faith and reason. My plan is to focus on a single question. How and in what sense does the mystery of Jesus Christ reveal and illuminate the relationship between person and act? So three steps. Part one will sketch in broad strokes how John Paul II conceives the relationship between Christology and anthropology. The second part will consider the gift of the Eucharist as the culmination of Christ's saving work and the perfect archetype of the relationship between person and act. The third step will be to return to the theme of philosophical anthropology under the heading Toward an Anthropology of Gift. So part one, Jesus Christ, Redeemer of Man. In his seminal book, Introduction to Christianity, Joseph Ratzinger avers that the most fundamental feature of Christian faith is its personal character. I quote, Christian faith is more than the option in favor of a spiritual ground to the world. Its central formula is not, I believe in something, but I believe in you, Jesus of Nazareth, as the meaning, the logos of the world and of my life. For John Paul II, the confession of faith in Jesus Christ involves, as it were, a double movement. First, there is a recognition of Jesus as the beloved son of the Father, the one who from all eternity has received his being as a gift from the Father and whose mission is to reconcile the world to God by revealing the unfathomable love of the Father. In his encyclical on the mercy of God, John Paul II writes, I quote, the cross on Calvary, the cross upon which Christ conducts his final dialogue with the Father, emerges from the very heart of that love that man, created in the image and likeness of God, has been given as a gift according to God's eternal plan. God, as Christ has revealed him, does not merely remain closely linked to the world as the creator and ultimate source of existence. He is also Father. He is linked to man, whom he called into existence in the visible world, by a bond still more intimate than that of creation. It is a love which not only creates the good, but also grants participation in the very life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For he who loves desires to give himself. End of quote. The second movement follows the logic of the incarnation. The way that Christ reveals the love of the Father is by assuming a human nature and living a genuinely human life. A life within a family, a life of prayer and work, and a life offered back to God in gratitude and thanksgiving. Without confusion or separation, there is a divine dimension and a human dimension to the mystery of Jesus Christ and his work of redemption. Jesus Christ, true God and true man, reveals the deepest truth of God. God is a communion of persons, an eternal exchange of love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he reveals the truth of human existence. Human persons are made in the image of God who is love and who has inscribed in our being the vocation to love. In a well-known passage in Redemptor Hominis, he writes, man cannot live without love. He remains a being that is incomprehensible for himself. His life is senseless if love is not revealed to him, if he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. This is why Christ the Redeemer fully reveals man to himself. When he seeks to further unfold the content of what Christ reveals about human nature and about our personal mode of existence, John Paul II turns to a second text of Gaudium et Spes. Man, the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. This double affirmation receives its deepest confirmation and grounding in the mystery of Christ the Redeemer. Our existing for our own sake is a sign of the generosity of God who bestows the gift of being in the act of creation and who remains faithful to his creation despite human sinfulness. How precious must man be, writes John Paul II, in the eyes of the creator if he gained so great a redeemer, if God gave his son in order that man should not perish but have eternal life. If the mystery of redemption discloses a new depth to human dignity, it also confirms the most basic vocation of human beings. 
To be a human person is to receive the gift of existence from the creator, who, so to speak, hands man over to himself. With this gift comes a great responsibility. From the very moment of conception and then of birth, says John Paul II, the new being is meant to express fully his humanity, to find himself as a person. To be fully human in accordance with the gift received is to give oneself in love. Every human person without exception desires to be loved and to love. This is what we are made for. This, will what will, this is what will bring true and authentic happiness or joy. The figure of Jesus Christ reveals this truth of human existence and by sharing his life in love, he makes possible a new form of life in communion with him. In a key passage in Evangelium Vitae, John Paul II brings together the divine and human dimensions of the mystery of redemption. He writes, there is a particular event which moves me deeply when I consider it. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Afterwards, the Roman soldier pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. Everything has now reached its complete fulfillment. The giving up of the spirit describes Jesus' death, a death like that of every other human being. But it also seems to allude to the gift of the spirit by which Jesus ransoms us from death and opens before us a new life. It is the very life of God which is now shared with man. Jesus, who upon entering the world made himself obedient to the Father in everything, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, giving himself completely for them. In this way, Jesus proclaims that life finds its center, its meaning, and its fulfillment when it is given up. So part two, the gift of the Eucharist as the bond of person and act. From his, final encyclical, sorry, from his first encyclical letter through his final years of patient suffering, the mystery of Christ's Eucharist is both the unifying center and the final goal aimed at for all of John Paul II's life and thought. The church, he writes, has received the Eucharist from Christ our Lord, not as one gift, however precious, among many others, but as the gift par excellence. For it is the gift of himself, of his person in his sacred humanity, as well as the gift of his saving work. The Eucharist is the ultimate goal of every human desire because here we attain God, and God joins himself to us in a most perfect union. What is perhaps most characteristic of John Paul II's approach to the Eucharist is the mystery of reciprocal communion, communio personarum. When Catholics hear the word Eucharist, or the sacrament of the Eucharist, we think, and correctly, of the mystery whereby, through the words of the priest and the working of the Holy Spirit, bread and wine are transubstantiated into the true body and true blood of the risen Lord. The church has always safeguarded the mystery of Christ's real or substantial presence in the Eucharist. Why? Why is this truth about real presence so central and so essential for our faith and for the church's life and mission? Because, John Paul II teaches, the gift communicated is nothing less than Christ himself. To love is to give oneself to the beloved. And to give oneself, or the substance of one's life, is precisely to give the whole, or the totality of one's life. The entire historical life of the incarnate Son is concentrated and included in this sacrifice and gift of communion. Several consequences follow from this insight of John Paul II. The first is a radical grounding of the mystery of the Eucharist in the incarnate life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The Eucharistic liturgy is not in the first place a sacred rite performed by certain members of the church after Christ has died and ascended to the Father. The first meaning of the Eucharist is the very life of the incarnate Son who offers himself as a gift to the Father and the church in a supremely free act of love. The first and all-encompassing liturgy is the paschal mystery of the incarnate Son, who offers his body and blood. The church's liturgy is a participation in the primary reality of Christ's own life, death, and resurrection. The second point follows closely upon the first. The action of giving himself as Eucharist is grounded in and discloses the deepest personal identity of Christ as the beloved Son of the Father. 
The Greek word eucharistia means thanksgiving. The form of Christ's life from the first moment of the incarnation is a grateful reception of his existence from the Father, coincident with an offering of his life back to the Father. Christ can give the whole of his life in this sacrament because his entire life was already Eucharistic. The Eucharist then does not come simply at the end or after Christ's historical life, perhaps as a reminder of his passion, death, and resurrection. The Eucharist is a form of life, a mode of personal existence, a way of being and acting that encompasses the totality of Christ's historical life and mission. He is the eternal Son, who has received all from the Father and who offers his life back to the Father in love. Operare sequitur esse, this action of making a gift of his life in a filial mode, that is, in going to the end of love and freely allowing his historical and bodily existence to be given by the Holy Spirit, reveals his unique personal identity as son. The third point concerns the church's participation in Christ's sacrificial offering. Both at the foot of the cross and at the heart of the church's liturgy, Christ's Eucharist includes the church's reception of this gift in faith and love. The church not only receives the gift of the Eucharist, she shares in the sacrifice by offering Christ back to the Father. And she does this offering by offering herself and the gifts of creation, symbolized by bread and wine by offering them back to the Father in a sacrifice of praise. The Eucharist is an exchange of life and love, a holy communion. We can say, writes John Paul II, not only that each of us receives Christ, but also that Christ receives each of us. He enters into friendship with us. Eucharistic communion brings about in a sublime way the mutual abiding of Christ and each of his followers. To better understand this mystery of reciprocal communion grounded in Christ's gift of himself, John Paul II turns to the figure of Mary, whom he says can guide us toward this most holy sacrament because she herself has a profound relationship with it. If the Eucharist is, in truth, a gift that can only be received by offering the whole of one's life, all that one is and all that one does, we immediately encounter a difficulty. No one is worthy of this gift. No one is able to really understand what is being given. No one is able to say yes without reservation. It is only the faith of the church, concretized in the figure of Mary, that allows us to receive this gift in a worthy manner. Mary, who is without sin, shows us what it really means to consent to Christ's sacrifice and to receive his body and blood by saying yes. That is, by offering her life, soul, and body in order to receive Christ and hand on the gift thereby showing the astonishing fruitfulness of Christ's sacrifice. The unique bond of person and act that is realized in the mystery of the incarnation and supremely in the sacrifice of the cross was entrusted to Mary at the Annunciation and again at Golgotha. An undivided yes unites these two events, a consent to God's plan to offer his own life in a sacrificial exchange, what the fathers of the church called an admirabile commercium, the form and fruit of this exchange is a covenant, an irrevocable union between God and his creation. Mary's consent to the death of Christ is simultaneously a new reception of his incarnate life and love in its pneumatic and Eucharistic modality. As the Gospel of John suggests, Mary's consent to Christ's sacrificial death opens up a new form of motherhood that is both concrete and universal and the very heart of the church's faith. So part three, toward an anthropology of gift. In Fides et Ratio, John Paul II says, the mystery of the incarnation will always remain the central point of reference for understanding the enigma of human existence. The challenge of this mystery pushes philosophy to its limits, even as reason is summoned to make this logic its own. So how and in what sense does the mystery of the incarnation, which culminates in Christ's gift of himself in the Eucharist, challenge and deepen the philosophical anthropology set forth in person and act. The first thing to be said in response to this question is, gratia supponit e perficit naturum. The new gift of grace, the light of faith, presupposes and perfects nature. Just as the incarnation 
presupposes and perfects Christ's human nature. The philosophical truths that are secured in person and act regarding the lived experience of human action, the personal structure of self-determination, the integration of nature and person, the inviolable dignity and transcendence of personal existence provide a sure foundation for John Paul II's theological teaching as Supreme Shepherd of the Church. This anthropological vision guides and informs his writings on the mystery of Christ's incarnation, on the foundations of morality, and especially on the missionary task of the Church in the context of the world today. At the same time, there is something new that comes to light in the later writings of John Paul II. This novelty is less a correction or retraction of earlier arguments, but a new emphasis that enriches his anthropological vision. For me, the, the simplest way to characterize or describe this development is a deeper appreciation of the meaning of gift, or what might be called an anthropology of gift. The point of departure and the horizon of reflection for person and act is the lived experience of a subject who acts and who by acting determines himself in relation to the truth about the good. In later writings, the idea and the experience of receiving oneself as a gift and the vocation to love that is inscribed in this gift becomes central to John Paul II's anthropology. There are, I think, two major sources for this development of an anthropology of gift. The first is theological. It stems from contemplating and communicating the mystery of Jesus Christ who reveals the truth of human existence. Christ is the Son who from all eternity receives his being as a gift from the Father. Christ reveals the true nature of our existence as creatures who receive our being as a gift from God. This relation to God is constitutive of our personhood. It informs the meaning of human freedom and self-determination. In the words of David L. Schindler, who devoted much of his life to understanding this truth, he writes, generosity characterizes the central and most basic act of my being. The creature in itself bears from within its original and inmost depths as a creature reference to God as giver. The act of essay that is communicated to me by God subsists only by virtue of my agency, agere, qua ends, substance, but this exercising of essay involves actively receiving an act, essay, that is always first given and thus serves as the inner forming condition of all my other activities." End of quote. The second source for John Paul II's anthropology of gift is more properly philosophical. One of John Paul II's most significant contributions to the life and mission of the church concerns the role of marriage and the family within the plan of God for creation and redemption. Already in the 1950s, but in a way that continued to unfold and deepen in response to the anthropological crisis of our time, John Paul II conceived of marriage and the family not merely as a discrete area for the church's pastoral care. It is rather the case that hum the human love between man and woman, the bond of marriage, and especially the gift of new life, are symbolic realities that shed light on the meaning of human existence on the truth of our identity and vocation as human persons. The reality of marriage is an important resource for a philosophical account of the human person. A single text will serve to illustrate this claim. In his 1994 letter to families, John Paul II writes, when a man and woman in marriage mutually give and receive each other in the unity of one flesh, the logic of sincere gift of self becomes part of their life. The process from conception and growth in the mother's womb to birth makes it possible to create a space within which the new creature can be revealed as a gift. Indeed, this is what it is from the very beginning. Could this frail and helpless being, totally dependent on its parents and completely entrusted to them, be seen in any other way? The newborn child gives itself to its parents by the very fact of its coming into existence. Its existence is already a gift the first gift of the creator to the creature, end of quote. So children are the supreme gift of marriage and a living reflection of spousal love. But just who is giving what to whom? In their reciprocal exchange of vows and the consummation of this exchange in spousal union, each spouse simultaneously give themselves and they gift 
and they give, in a sense, the gift of a child to their beloved, and they receive a child from their beloved. And yet, as every parent knows, there is a mysterious excess at the heart of their giving and receiving. Within a healthy relationship, each spouse recognizes that their love for each other and the fruit of their love is not simply their own. The reality of the child, a third, cannot be reduced to their agency. The child is not manufactured or produced by the spouses, but received as an undeserved gift. This excess or gratuity points to God as the true origin and end of both their giving and their receiving and the fruit of their reciprocal love. This opening to God from within the heart of spousal love sheds light on the astonishing turn in the passage cited above. The child is not only a gift, as John Paul II tells us, but he or she gives himself to the parents. The key question is, what could a helpless child possibly give to its parents? There's something profoundly useless about a newly conceived child. In an obvious sense, it cannot do anything except reveal what it is, a gift. The child's very existence is a gift from God, but it's also a gift that is mediated by the child's mother and father. These relations are constitutive of the child's being. In this light, we can return to the double affirmation of Gaudium et Spes. Each person created for their own sake, and each person discovers himself through a sincere gift of self. Some interpreters of the Council and some interpreters of John Paul II take this text unilaterally in the sense that self-possession is understood as the necessary condition for self-donation, right? self-mastery for the sake of self-giving. What comes first is substance, a form of self-possession that is then capable of freely entering into relationships. There is a sense in which this priority of substance or ontological selfhood over relation is true and consonant with John Paul II's thinking about the person. However, by drawing our attention to the metaphysical significance of childhood, to the being of the child as gift, John Paul II corrects a possible one-sidedness. In one sense, he introduces a new question for thinking, thinking about substance or what John Crosby calls the incommunicable selfhood of the person. If it is true that selfhood grounds our ability to enter into relations, we should also ask about the source or ground of our selfhood. Self-possession, being created for one's own sake, is itself a gift. Here we might recall the words of Augustine, quid tam tuum quam tu, quid tam non tuum quam tu. What is so much yours as yourself? What is so little yours as yourself? The innermost core of our personal identity, our I, is itself a gift received from others. Gift is not merely something that we do, it is something that we are, rooted in the act of being, or essay, that is a sign of the generosity of God. Operare sequitur esse. An essay is the first of God's gifts. So in conclusion, let me return to the question that Carol Wojtyla posed on the eve of the Second Vatican Council. Um, what does it mean to be a human person? This is an ancient question that the psalmist posed. Who is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou carest for him? The most compelling and comprehensive answer to this question is the mystery of the incarnation, which is extended and communicated in the sacraments of the church, especially the Eucharist. The sacraments of the church, like Voitio's anthropology, are a mystery of nature and grace a new gift of God that reveals the beauty of God's original creation, as well as the vocation of the human person to give glory to God by receiving the gift of creation and offering it back to God. In the Eucharist, the sacrament of sacraments, God's redemptive action is, as it were, condensed and hidden under the appearance of bread and wine. At the same time, there's a, there's a capaciousness to this gift. This gift can and should encompass the whole of one's life and action, and ultimately the entire order of creation. We are made by God, and we are made for God. This gift is a pledge and a promise of everlasting life in communion with him. Thank you.